This is Brett the Hitman Hart, and you're watching another original wrestling documentary. Edward Fatu, known to his friends and family as Eki, performed under the ring name Umaga. As a younger brother of the Tonga Kid and Rikishi, and a nephew of Afa and Sika of the Wild Samoans, wrestling was in his blood. He made his in-ring debut in 1994 in his uncle's promotion, World Extreme Wrestling. He would appear in Frontier Martial Arts Wrestling in Japan, when him and his cousin Matt formed a tag team calling themselves Armageddon. They would later join the WWF and be known as Three Minute Warning. Throughout his career, he would perform under several ring monikers such as ECMO, Jamal, but most notably from 2006 to 2009 in the WWE where he wrestled as Zumaga and would reach main event status. Arguably one of the highlights of his career was WrestleMania 23 when he represented Vince McMahon in the Battle of the Billionaires. He was released from his contract in WWE after violating its wellness policy and refusing to enter treatment. He wrestled his last match in November 2009 on the Hulkamania tour in Australia. The next month he would be found unresponsive by his wife and taken to hospital, where he was pronounced dead. According to his autopsy report, a combination of heart disease and a deadly mixture of three different types of prescription medication led to his untimely passing. Eddie was a continuation of a disturbing pattern of wrestlers passing before the age of 40 due to drugs or painkiller abuse. Umaga is the Samoan meaning for the end, which is a tragic parallel to the life of Eddie Fatu. At the time, many considered him to be the best worker in the family. During his relatively short run as Umaga throughout WWE's Ruthless Aggression era, he became one of the most unforgettable characters to fans, but seemingly forgotten by the company after his passing. Known in the ring as the Samoan Bulldozer, but behind the curtain he was known as one of the most sweethearted men in the industry. This is the story of Eddie Fatu. Professional wrestler Edward Fatu, who performed under the name Umaga, died Friday at a Houston hospital, said a WWE spokesman. A family friend said Fatu was found unresponsive at home by his family and never regained consciousness. Doctors indicated that he died of a heart attack. He was just 36. Edward Fatu was born in American Samoa on March 28, 1973. His mother, Vera Fatu, was a sister of Afa and Sika of the Wild Samoans, who in the span of their career captured 21 tag team titles throughout various promotions. Being the younger brother of WWE Hall of Famer Rikishi and the legendary Tonga Kid, wrestling was in his blood. The family would go on to produce some of the greatest performers of all time, including Yokozuna, Roman Reigns and the Uso brothers among others. In November 1992, he was married and early the following year, him and his wife had their first of four children. He trained under his uncle Afa and began wrestling in his World Extreme Wrestling promotion in 1995. He formed a tag team with his cousin Matt, who would later be known as Rosie. He had tremendous agility, speed and endurance for his size. According to the Observer, Kim Wood, an assistant coach with the Cincinnati Bengals at the time, commented upon seeing him work on Les Thatcher shows, that somehow he must have slipped through the system because a guy that size and agility should be in the NFL. He and his cousin Matt dominated the tag team division everywhere they went. In March of 1999, the duo made their Japan debut in Frontier Martial Arts Wrestling in a tag team tournament, calling themselves Armageddon 1 and 2. In May of 2000, he would perform under the name Eddie Fatu, while his cousin as Matty Samu, and known as the Samoans, briefly capturing the WEW Hardcore Tag Team titles before dropping them and leaving Japan. The following year, still calling themselves the Samoans, they would have a WWF tryout match at a house show in Columbus, Georgia, losing to Charlie and Ross Haas. They officially signed developmental contracts with the World Wrestling Federation, 
and were assigned to Heartland Wrestling Association, adopting the tag team name The Island Boys, now using the ring names ECMO and Chemo. Throughout 2001, they would make a handful of appearances in WWF, both on Jacked and Sunday Night Heat. They won the HWA Tag Team Championship in November of 2001 by defeating Evan Courageous and Shannon Moore. They also competed for Memphis Championship Wrestling, holding the MCW Southern Tag Team Championship on three occasions. According to the Bleacher Report, when Ross Haas died from a heart attack, the three people that found him dead were Lance Cade, Charlie Haas, and Eddie. Since that time, Haas said that Lance Cade and Eddie were his two best friends. While the WWF changed its title to the WWE, the cousins would also be given new names. Eddie was renamed Jamal and Matt renamed Rosie, and they made their main roster debut on the July 22, 2002 episode of Raw as Three Minute Warning, a team of nefarious hoodlums. They were hired as enforcers for Eric Bischoff, attacking random wrestlers each week. After Bischoff gave people three minutes to entertain him, or they would face being ambushed by the duo. They attacked countless wrestlers at the command of Bischoff, including D'Lo Brown and Sean Stasiak. The team had a memorable run as Three Minute Warning. Their last match was on Sunday Night Heat on May 26, 2003, losing to Maven and Tommy Dreamer. The WWE dropped the angle. He was released and the company began filling its roster with new talent from its developmental territory. For the time being, him and his cousin Matt would go their own separate ways. Matt would remain in the WWE and embark in a superhero in training angle with Gregory Helms. To avoid any legal issues with WWE, Eddie would change his ring name from Jamal to ECMO and wrestled a handful of matches in MLW, teaming with both Mana and Samu. In October of 2003, he would sign with TNA and form a team with Sunny Siaki. Later that year, he would return to All Japan Pro Wrestling as Jamal, forming several short-lived tag teams with Just Incredible, Teo Ki, Buchanan, and D'Lo Brown. He would spend most of 2004 and 2005 working for All Japan Pro Wrestling, but would make brief appearances during his trips back to the US and TNA, as well as a handful of appearances for NWE during their Destiny tour in Europe. He returned to WWE in December 2005, signing a new deal. At first, the plans were he and his cousin Matt were rehashing their three-minute warning gimmick, but after seeing him in a squash match and the improvement he had made in the ring, Vince McMahon decided to pull the plug on the plans and groom him for a big run as a singles wrestler, now calling himself Umaga. He would be featured as a Samoan character, similar to that of his uncles, uncontrollable and spoke no English, which made it impossible for a ref to do anything about his attacks. According to The Observer, an idea was constructed that Gary Hart would form a heel stable with Umaga as its top gun called Black Friday Management. The concept was to portray Gary Hart as a Don King type with a criminal vibe and dress him like Suge Knight with a mob style business suit, with the idea that he was independent of WWE and bringing talent to the organization. There was also an idea that Hart would be accompanied by a hot Asian girl based on Gogo Yubari, the Catholic schoolgirl assassin in Kill Bill. Hart felt he physically couldn't do it and had moved on. Vince McMahon was never warmed to the idea because Hart was originally going to be the manager of Earthquake John Tenta at one point. Hart showed up at the airport in the city for his debut taping and nobody was there to pick him up. When he finally got to the arena, already mad about the treatment, he got into an argument with Jay Strongbow, left the building and went home. Hart still followed wrestling until his death but had no interest in being a part of it. He was paired with Armando Estrada, and the two ended up having good chemistry. Over the next year, Umaga and Armando ran over mid and lower card WWE talent. During his first year with the company, many observers noted that he moved quicker and better than any other man his size. His gimmick and heritage combined made him a shoe-in for the top tier of the WWE. Estrada was a great talker, and they didn't want Umaga to speak English in order to get over the savage gimmick. Later, they spent literally months trying to figure out some sort of way to get him to speak. And then suddenly, one day out of nowhere, he just cut a normal promo. 
Umaga gained victories over all of Raw's top performers including Triple H, Shawn Michaels and John Cena, who was still champion at the time. He also ended up sending Kane to SmackDown after winning a Loser Leaves Raw match. On the February 19th episode of Raw, Umaga was announced as Vince McMahon's frontman for Battle of the Billionaires with Donald Trump at WrestleMania 23. Instantly after selecting Umaga, McMahon granted him a match against the Intercontinental Champion Jeff Hardy, and four minutes later, he was crowned the new Intercontinental Champion. This would be the beginning of an enormous push he would receive that year. For the next several weeks, he would face John Cena during main events during house shows. His career peaked in WrestleMania 23, when he and Bobby Lashley were the surrogates for Vince McMahon and Donald Trump in the hair vs. hair match, which was the biggest money drawing match in the history of the industry, doing 1.2 million buys on pay-per-view. Even though he lost, he was featured on the show's main event, further upping his status in the company. On April 16, 2007, on a Raw episode from Milan, Italy, his opponent was picked from the crowd by Vince McMahon. He said his name was Santino Morella. At first glimpse, this looked like it was going to be another squash match. But with interference by Bobby Lashley, he lost the match and his title. For the next month, Santino would achieve seemingly accidental wins to keep the title while being paraded as an innocent childlike personality who is smaller in stature and not experienced enough to mix it up with seasoned veterans. He even locked out and won a successful title defense against Umaga before losing the belt back to him in a return match on July 2, 2007. Eddie remained a high card performer and most notably in a feud with Jeff Hardy in late 2007, having some great encounters including a Falls Count Anywhere match at the Extreme Rules pay-per-view. Over the following months, Eddie would suffer a couple of injuries which would keep him off TV and lower his standing within the WWE ranks, but with more injuries came more painkillers. In an August 2007 article by Sports Illustrated and the Washington Post, Eddie was named as a number of pro wrestlers and other professional athletes to have purchased pharmaceuticals from an online pharmacy. He was reported to have received a growth hormone between July and December 2006. This was his first violation of the wellness policy. He was suspended for 30 days and immediately lost the Intercontinental title to Jeff Hardy on the September 2nd episode of Raw. His first match back was a title shot against Triple H at the No Mercy pay-per-view, in which he came up short. Eddie's push seemed to be over, although he was still in high-profile matches, his status as a main eventer was slipping away. He would be written in a countless one-shot angles, and even form a short-lived team with Randy Orton, but mostly be putting over other superstars like Triple H and Jeff Hardy. In February of 2008, it appeared his career was back on track, as he competed in the main event on the No Way Out pay-per-view in the Elimination Chamber match. The next week on Raw, he would squash D.H. Smith in under two minutes, and Super Crazy the next week in 41 seconds. On April 26, while participating in the WrestleMania Revenge Tour across Europe, Eddie received word his mother, Vera Fatu, passed away. He immediately flew home to be with his family. Two weeks later, he was back on the road. In July, he was sent from Raw to SmackDown for a headlining feud with The Undertaker. But on August 2, 2008, he suffered a torn PCL from a bad landing outside the ring in a match in Johnson City, Tennessee. After being examined by WWE's Dr. Martha Dodson, a sports medicine specialist, she decided he didn't require surgery. It was reported he would go through rehabilitation instead. She would go on to say, The concern of anyone with an injury such as this will be coming back too soon because you could worsen the injury or actually suffer more injuries to the rest of the knee, said Dodson. In his situation, because of his level of competition, it would not only be very painful to return, but could potentially worsen other injuries. I think a minimum of four to six weeks is a pretty rapid time for him to get back into action. But like most men and women who fill top spots on the roster, any time missed can be career suicide. So Eddie did what most top tier talent did, and used painkillers to minimize his time away from the company, and he was back in the ring in less than a month, which would prove to be a mistake. After a series of house shows against Gregory Helms, he spent the rest of 2008 nursing the torn ligament, making only a couple of appearances. 
Custom Muscle is your wholesale distributor, not only for superstars of the WWE, but for health and fitness enthusiasts everywhere. With our wide range of sports nutrition and supplement products, top of the line protein and energy drinks, Custom Muscle was designed for everyone's needs, no matter who you are or what you're trying to accomplish. From training tips to diet nutrition advice to forums and everyday health related topics, we will help you customize your muscle needs. Visit us at custommuscle.com. On October 1st, 2008, while still recovering from his injury, him and longtime friend Charlie Haas became business partners in an attempt to plan for his future outside the WWE and still be able to provide for his family. They opened up a vitamin and supplement store which also incorporated a smoothie bar and online forum. The store was located in Frisco, Texas. Eddie returned to the WWE for a short time in January to build up a match with Triple H, but after that, Creative didn't have any ideas for him. One problem he faced throughout his run as Umaga that became more prevalent during his series of matches with Helms was the crowd cheered him over the babyface. When he was supposed to be portrayed as a heel, that created a problem with WWE writers. February 6th on SmackDown, he would face Funaki, which turned out to be a squash. Fans cheered for Umaga, although it sounded like WWE tried to drown them out. Dave Meltzer would note in the February 16th Observer, Umaga had trimmed down. On the February 20th edition of SmackDown, he faced Scotty Goldman, aka Colt Cabana. Vince hated the first match they did and made them go out and do it again which Colt Cabana probably knew was the beginning of the end for him. Umaga ended it quickly in a completely one-sided match. He took another hiatus in April to deal with the problems he was having with his torn ligament. He was brought back in May for a feud with CM Punk before Punk's heel turn. The way the Triple H and Punk feuds were booked, it made it clear his stock had dropped, and because The Undertaker was out now with an injury, their storyline was put on hold. According to The Observer, there was a feeling that he had returned out of shape and was noticeably slower in the ring. On the May 22nd SmackDown show, he spoke English, breaking his Samoan wildman gimmick, even though allowing him to speak English had been talked about for more than a year beforehand. In the May 26th Observer, Dave Meltzer would write, Why is Umaga talking? Gimmick? Killed. Realistically, this makes no difference, but it upsets me that instead of getting this guy a great manager, now he's just talking and breathing heavy into the mic. Worse, when he left up the ramp, he started ranting and raving. On the June 7th Extreme Rules pay-per-view show in New Orleans, he lost a Samoan strap match to CM Punk that he was originally scheduled to win. The next day it was announced he had been released due to failing a drug test, but he claimed to family and friends he quit. He was given a choice to go to rehab or not, and decided not to. As reported on WWE.com on Monday, June 8, 2009, WWE superstar Umaga, Eddie Fatu, has been released from his World Wrestling Entertainment contract. However, consistent with the practice of announcing wellness policy violations, it should be noted that Umaga's termination was due to his second violation of the WWE wellness program and his refusal to enter a rehabilitation facility but the chance to return would come when he signed to do the Hulkamania tour. He was one of several of the wrestlers on the tour contacted by the WWE, with pressure put on them not to do the tour. However, all the names announced, including Eddie, had signed contracts, so he kept his commitments. He was expected to return at the next year's Royal Rumble. Everyone liked him, and Hogan said that he wanted to get him into TNA. There was certainly interest from that side but Eddie told people there was no way he was going there and that he was heading back to the WWE as soon as the tour was over. He told others on tour that he had too much loyalty to the McMahons, in particular saying that he felt a degree of loyalty to Stephanie and Triple H, who gave him his biggest career opportunity, and that he would be returning there even though Hulk Hogan was still attempting to recruit him. His final match was on November 28, 2009 in Sydney, Australia. He had just returned home from the tour, when he suffered a heart attack at his home in Texas. He was found by his wife on December 4th, and despite their best attempts, paramedics were unable to revive him. The heart attack was so severe that the family was called once he was admitted into the hospital and told to fly in because he wouldn't last much longer. He was being kept alive through life support, but suffered a second heart attack the next day. 
the final autopsy report listing his death as accidental, caused by acute toxicity due to the combined effects of somas, Vicodin, and Valium. He also had heart issues, including an enlarged heart, which is common among young wrestlers' deaths, as well as kidney failure, and his liver went into shock, likely from the heart attack. There is no evidence of him having consumed alcohol the night he died. His death was a major heartbreak to the family, which had a series of tragedies in a short period of time, including the death of Vera Fatu, his mother, and the sister of Afa and Sika, seven months earlier from cancer. Afa wrote, On behalf of my family, we are devastated and shocked by the loss of Areki, our son, nephew, brother, cousin, husband, father. Our hearts are broken and words can't express what each of us are feeling. It is so comforting to know how loved Eki is by his family, peers, friends, and most of all his fans. When I received that AM phone call that my nephew was in the hospital, I dug deep and prayed and cried and begged for a miracle. When we lost Eki, I knew it was God's will and that he is with my sister, his mother who passed within the last year. We are making plans now for our farewell to Eki, but I wanted to take this time to thank everyone for all the thousands of posts, emails, letters, and cards. Although I've not been able to bring myself to answer them personally, your kindness does not go unnoticed. I want to especially thank our WWE family and Stephanie McMahon for everything, and her phone call was very comforting to me in my time of sorrow. God bless each and every one of you. I've said it a hundred times. The best people in the world are our wrestling people. You'll never find a more dedicated group of people. Be safe and healthy and love one another. During an episode of Talk is Jericho, former WWE writer Court Bauer stated Vince McMahon was torn apart by Eddie's death. He would go on to say, I vividly remember when he passed away, and I remember how legit sad Vince was about it, because at the time, I think they had let him go because he wouldn't go to rehab, and I remember Vince really saying like, I tried, I did not want this to happen. I couldn't do anything. Like, if you're not going to go do it on your own, there's nothing we can do. During his last match when he pinned Ken Anderson, Anderson commented how spooky it was that he had Umaga and Eddie Guerrero's final match before either man died. Eddie would be instrumental in bringing his two nephews, Jonathan and Joshua Fatu, known professionally as Jimmy and Jey Uso to the WWE. According to Rikishi, his younger brother was always close with his sons. While he was away in Pensacola and planning to return to Houston, he told the twins, who were installing office furniture at the time, it was now or never. They packed their bags, said goodbye to their families, and embarked on the 10-hour drive to Houston with their uncle and never looked back. They trained at Booker T School and the next year made their debut in Florida Championship Wrestling. Their success was bittersweet, as the same day they signed their contracts with the WWE was the same day Eddie passed away. The brothers have become one of the most entertaining tag teams on the WWE roster, and both critics and peers consider them to be one of the best tag teams in WWE history. Eddie was well liked and respected by those who worked closely with him in the WWE. Despite his previous tenure and respect within the company, WWE did not acknowledge his death on television in any way, which one can speculate was for PR reasons, which will forever remain a sore point with some of his family members and his fans around the world. In the 2009 awards issue of The Observer, Dave Meltzer would list WWE not acknowledging the death of Umaga on TV, the number four most disgusting promotional tactic. Eddie leaves behind a legacy in the Samoan dynasty that many say is one of the biggest contributions of this decade, not only making a huge impact during his time as an upper card talent, but without Eddie, the Uso brothers could very well still be assembling office furniture. As well, in following family tradition, his son Zilla is currently training at Booker T School in Texas and hopes to join his cousins in the bloodline. That was the story of Eddie Fatu.